off right. There you go. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Eric's on top of it. All right. So good morning, you guys. Can you see my screen? Yes. Welcome officially, everybody, to the first 1 million cups of the year 2021. Though I did have somebody who said, uh, welcome to the, yesterday I got on me and she said, welcome to the 378th year or day of 2020. Like, that's how it feels for me. I was like, that's fair. <laughs> but we're excited to, as always, start off our year on the right foot by focusing on the power of entrepreneurship and the amazing stories that are happening right here in our community. Community. We do this every other week, so the second Wednesday and the fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, we get together virtually at the moment to hear two powerful entrepreneurs share a little bit about their story and what they are doing, and then all of us band together. And I can't say we have a small but mighty group on the line today because I think we're going to be able to get you guys some amazing resources and connect you throughout the community. So we're super glad to have both Walter and Nargis join us as our speakers for the first presentation. So uh, what we're going to do real quick is go through a quick introduction about 1 million cups uh, and then hold on real quick. Yes, we have, we have a special presenter who will be joining us today as well. And so she is going to be giving a quick presentation. Give me five minutes to wrap up my comments and then I'll let you go first. Okay. Her class broke early. So she's already chomping at the bit. So go get your notes, Ken's, and start your vocal warmups. <laughs> All right. So welcome again to Phoenix One Million Cups. We are the West Valley and the East Valley working together as a powerful collaborative to bring together uh, all of the One Million Cups communities, especially in this virtual environment. We are actually one of a large network of One Million Cups that are meeting currently across the country. And so both Nargish and Walter, now you have the opportunity to connect with communities across the country. One Million Cups was created by the Kaufman Foundation, who's focused on the power of entrepreneurship entrepreneurship and accessing entrepreneurship for everybody. And so it was really designed to get people into the art of practicing entrepreneurship. You can get entrepreneurs in a room, you can share cards, they walk away and nothing happens. But when you get them to practice the art of pitching, sharing what it is that they're doing, actually working together, that's really where you see the connectivity of a strong community come together. And so that's really what we are here. We are national but local mission. So that list of all of those volunteers are what makes this event happen and helps spread the word across Phoenix in general. So we're super excited to have a, two of our committee members, my colleague Eric, as well as Susanna on the line. Uh, and we have a whole list, especially in the East Valley, as well as the West Valley of volunteers that make this event happen. As you can see, we are part of the Western region. And these are just some of the communities that are currently meeting at this time zone right now in the One Million Cups community. A couple of votes on how One Million Cups is different. It's a presentation and not a pitch. Uh, so talk a little bit about yourself and your story. We're here to support you as the entrepreneur. The more that you can do authentic connections, being honest about the challenges that you're facing, about the realities of where you're at, the easier it is for us to support you and to connect with you. We are run for the community by the community. So while we have this great national network, we have a lot of flexibility to do what works best for us in our community. And especially in Phoenix, we love to say that One Million Cups is the welcome mat for the entrepreneurial community. Everyone is welcome. And we are radically inclusive, meaning we will call out and make sure that we have not only an inclusive approach to it, but that everybody feels welcome. And that everybody, no matter where they're at on their on their entrepreneurial journey, is given the resources they need to grow. I'll lower the desk, baby. You don't have to sit on the stand on the chair. <laughs> All right. So that is our core program. Today, we have a little bit of a different schedule as you will find out, but almost every community across the program, across the country does the same thing. Two presentations for six minutes, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. And the Q&A is really designed for us to learn a little bit more about you and what you've achieved so that we can help you in your request. The first question we will ask you after your presentation is, what can the million, I feel like we have to practice like everybody doing this at the same time. So you don't have to unmute, but maybe do like, like lip sync it with me, ready? What can the One Million Cups community do for you, right? There you go, well done, we'll practice that. 2021 20, goals, thank you guys for humoring me on uh, the lip sync battle here. 
We are always looking for new people to present. Hopefully this is the first time that we hear from Walter and Nargish, but we will hear from them a couple of times. We are always welcome to come back for what we call a refill. Hopefully we'll be able to get you some resources today to move you along your entrepreneurial journey as things evolve, as you need more practice, as you go into different avenues, always feel free to uh, revisit with us. I have someone asking me for the link and I'm gonna see who it is real quick so they can join us. There we go. All right, I will put that in once they get there. So make sure that you apply to present. We are gonna skip over the mobile. So just a couple of notes on safety. So we, like I said, make sure this is an inclusive community and we want everyone to feel safe. Uh, if for any reason something happens during this meeting that we don't feel comfortable with, uh, we will immediately shut down the room. Please watch your email so that if we have to reconvene, which we're hoping that will not happen, uh, check your email and we'll make sure to bring everybody back for that. If you do have to leave or if for any reason you get knocked off, no, you'll be put back in the waiting room. But but Eric, our uh, illustrious bodyguard, will let you in once you guys turn that on. Make sure to follow us on social media. And with that, we have a one special good morning, Marcus. How are you? Good morning. Good to see you. Good Happy to New see Year. you as well. Happy New Year. And so before we jump into our two main presentation, everybody gets to be part of a uh, Real quick, Eric, uh, it's Pam Slim who's texting, and then and um, Aisha, can you email them the Zoom link real quick? Thank you. Before we get too far into our main presentation, uh, the proud mom, Kristen Slice, is very excited to introduce another entrepreneur who is looking to earn her entrepreneurship badge today. And so my daughter, Kensington Slice, come on over, baby. <laughs> Is we going to be practice giving her two minute cookie presentation? So let me switch over my screen because she does have a PowerPoint presentation. And I am going to unplug that. Can you guys hear her okay? All right. Not yet. Not yet? You can't hear us? I hear you, not her. Go ahead, baby. Say morning. Good morning. All right, Kensington, why don't you start while mom's pulling this up by telling them how old you are and what grade you're in. I am Kensington, I am seven and a half and I'm a brownie. There you go. All right, now I have her screen. So let me share this real quick. Resume share. Nope, hold on, stop share. All right, baby. So your slide presentation is up. So Kensington, you have two minutes. Go ahead and give your presentation. I'm Kensington. I have a goal of 200 boxes and the more boxes you buy them, the more fun activities I can do like an animal dance party or building robots. You can order at me anytime and they'll be ordered directly to your door. Thank you and have a safe Valentine's Day. Good job, love, high five. Before you leave, <laughs> any questions for Kensington? What's your favorite cookie? Um, my favorite cookie is the samosas and the s'mores. Oh, okay. And Kensington, how much are these cookies, each box? Um, some of them are $6 and some of them are 5 Okay. Kensington, if I live in, the, in Gilbert, can you still make sure I get my cookies? Yes? Okay. How does that work, Ken? The good news is because of safety precautions, they're shipping all the cookies directly to your house. That's so true. you don't have to worry, no matter where you're at in the country watching this recording, you can order and it'll be at your door. Right. And so Kensington, how, how do we order from you, sweetheart? I didn't remember, but... <laughs> 
Remember how we were going to put the link when someone asked that? Don't worry. We have the link. We'll put it in the chat right now for you, Jenny. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. All right. Thank you, Kensington. One more round of applause for Kensington Slice. And she is going to go back and get to her first grade. Well done, baby. Super proud of you. Good Love job, you. Kensington. Good job. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for uh, helping a emerging entrepreneur earn her entrepreneurship badge. So thank you guys. All right. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our first official presenter of the day, Walter. Walter, you have six minutes to share a little bit of your venture and what you are doing. Okay, I will. Let me go to the share screen real quick as I talk uh, right here. Okay, so I am Walter um, with uh, close by. I am a uh, Northern Peoria resident for the last two years and uh, former uh, Air Force intelligence officer. Been an entrepreneur for over 20 years as far as business development goes. And I have a huge passion to empower communities uh, to actually join together by having strong businesses in their community to make the community actually uh, more viable, more profitable for everyone there. So just to give you a really quick overview on what Close By is, because I'm sure you have no idea, I am going to make sure I have sound on and show a quick two-minute video, which I know cuts into my time, but you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Understand how difficult running a business can be, managing the day-to-day -day activities and trying to grow your business. Because all of these boxes are in the way. Let me move it. All right, here we go. We understand how difficult running a business can be. Managing the day-to-day -day activities and trying to grow your business can be overwhelming. At Close By, we've created a digital platform that will keep your customers coming back while providing the tools to bring in new ones. Without integration or waiting, Close By gives your business a digital web and mobile platform, unlimited digital advertising, a loyalty program, customer analytics, emails, mobile messages, and so much more. With customized marketing materials and promo codes, Close By helps you communicate and jumpstart your program. Consumers download the Close By app, sign up using your promo code, and we automatically add them to your customer database, giving them bonus points at no charge to you. Customers find your business, use your promotions, collect their points, and redeem their rewards all through the mobile app. Driving foot traffic into your store has never been easier. Digital advertisements, coupons, limited time specials, and loyalty rewards can be easily created and posted online within minutes. Change them as often as you wish. Reward your customers with points. Use them instead of discounts, for customer purchases, and even for sharing your advertisements on social media. Celebrate your customer's loyalty and have them spend their points on rewards from your business or from a selection of thousands of items in Close By's online catalog. Get instant access to critical business data to know who your customers are and what advertisements are inspiring them. We know how busy you are. With Close By's managed services, let a professional manage the marketing for you. We become your own marketing department. Close By gives your business the edge with an affordable, state-of-the-art turnkey solution that will drive sales, excite consumers, and help you build a better business. And I gave you an overview of what Close By is. And um, what well, my goal is really to get away and enhance this, uh, you know, the theme right now of people having uh, basically directories of all people going, which helps out a consumer and a business, but it doesn't give the business what it really needs. So I want these businesses that are local, and it's not just shop local, but these local businesses to be strong by actually getting data from their customers and continue to engage with their customers so they can keep them coming back, which enhances their community feel. In other words, it's geolocated. So if I'm here in Peoria or wherever I am, I can just really frequent the business that I love and keep those guys in business so you get more of a community feel versus just a directory and things like that. 
And so we manage the whole process for you because yes, you can do self-service, but the fact that we can actually manage it, I think is really gonna make those businesses successful. And my goal is to actually have this across communities across the country, which is one reason I'm here with One Million Cups because you guys are a national organization um, in there and that's the type of help that I actually need in that area. And that's what I have right now for you. There you go. Thank you very much to Walter. A round of applause. <laughs> and so the very first question then, Walter, we ask is, what can the One Million Cups community do for you? One Million Cups can actually um, use your uh, you know, deep pool of resources to help me connect with uh, economic development departments um, across, you know, across the country because I've already made some inroads in those areas. But also, um, even if you feel inclined to actually help take a deep dive in the, into what I actually offer, and you guys can actually help use that as a line item for the entrepreneurs to actually come to your organization so you can actually provide this service to entrepreneurs and help them more successful along their way. Uh, one thing that we actually do is that, that I actually do is I actually give back to these small businesses and to different communities, whether it's economic development or chamber of commerce, actually give revenue back to them to make them more profitable to help initiatives to make the community stronger also in that way. And with that, I will open it up for 20 minutes of Q&A. We have a small enough group. You probably can just go ahead and unmute yourself and pop in with questions. So Jenny, it looks like you are unmuted and ready to go. Is that right? Am I reading sure. that right? Yeah. All right, um, Q&A, go ahead. So Walter, um, for uh, how does the fee structuring work? How do you get paid? Are you, oh, a, is get, this a franchise or is this 100% you or? It's not a franchise, a buddy of mine um, that I knew when I was in uh, Wi-Fi marketing, he actually created the app himself. And okay. then I took it over. And so I have my, uh, I have the entire system, I actually add in the groups from the way I get paid is, in other words, your group, say you're Peoria Chain of Commerce or Glendale, who Glendale's coming on tomorrow as an example. So Glendale's is a, is a, comes a partner, they have their own group and businesses that join from Glendale Chamber or the city of Glendale, Glendale actually gets paid because I'm giving them money as a favor to them if they want it. Some cities do not want revenue. And so it's basically it's set up for a salesperson, but I know people like to have that. So I basically get paid because my fee structure, I am discounting from 170 all the way down to $99 and then giving 30% of that revenue back to the organization itself. And so, and then I actually manage the process. You know, in a perfect world, I have a contact center that actually manages these, you know, these thousands of businesses that'll be there, but it literally takes because the way the system is set up, no more than 30 minutes of contact per month per business from ours on our side. Okay. okay. So Walter, I've got a little bit of a question for you, which is, you know, why economic development teams? Like, I'm curious about that target audience, mainly because you have, it's a robust technology platform. No offense, present company clearly excluded from the following statement, and especially dangerous since I'm recording it, right? In general, city economic development teams tend to be uh, late in the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? late adopters when it comes to like understanding technology and marketing and all of those pieces. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about why that target and what are some of the uh, feedback you've gotten from that target and how have you overcome it? Okay, eco development department because cities make money from sales tax, from retail. Sure. So therefore those businesses need to ask, those organizations need to get that sales tax revenue. So those businesses need to stay in business. So this is what this actually helps. And so obviously uh, a city has, you know, thousands of businesses under, so it's kind of a one to many approach. So it's kind of the natural as well as chain of commerces. In other words, I'm doing Hollywood Boulevard, which has 600 businesses through some agency partners. So they're adapting this for Hollywood Boulevard so they have their own community. I'm doing the city of Rochester, New York, and also East Hampton, Mass. 
uh, because they love that combined with the, as you know, the, the geofencing I have to bring people into it. So um, that's the reason for that. But it's also, again, Local First AZ is extremely excited about it. They've used those other platforms that you're aware of, and this is so much better. They just want to get uh, 50 companies on first, and then they'll put their full stamp and carry it. So it's just organizations that actually have a lot of businesses under them. So we're not knocking on individual doors because, again, these small businesses have heard it all from everyone. So that's why. Gotcha. Great. Did I answer, answer every you. question? You did. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Because uh, a piece of what I heard there, too, is like, it's not every economic development team within different cities, but especially cities that have a retail, an understanding of retail, yes. uh, what it looks like, things like that. That's the important piece to it. Yeah, and the co-branding aspect is really huge because we actually come up, you know, close by plus, since Peoria said close by plus Peoria have combined to make our community stronger. And that way the, the consumers will feel good about it but it's a partnership between this, this, the consumers and the businesses themselves, which I think sets us apart. Very cool. Other questions for Walter? Um, so Walter, hi, my name's Aslan and I am in uh, North Peoria as well. I, I'm curious where you keep saying I. So from what I understand, you're kind of a one man operation and I'm trying to do some basic math without coffee because I don't drink it. Um, <laughs> 30, 30 minutes per business owner a month. Um, is that all you do? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually, um, um, I'm part of uh, End Market, which is the, for the second year in a row, the number one uh, location-based marketing platform in the world. We, we beat them all. So that is the main thing, but couple uh, partnered with Close By is amazing. So it's not all I do at all because I have, like I say, a contact center, uh, this, this actually a client. Um, they have hundreds of uh, employees there it actually can manage the accounts themselves and all that. So I just give those guys a small fee uh, for each client. Oh, that is so awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, so it, I just I a, wanted clarification. <laughs> yeah. In a perfect world, I would have 10 people in the city of Phoenix. One take each zone. Hey, you got Camelback Corridor, North Phoenix, et cetera. And as soon as you get 500 to 1,000 businesses in that area, then you're making, you know, you know, fifty dollars times a thousand. You do the math on that. That's what you'd be making monthly on that side. So, in a perfect world, I would do that. But then again, finding people to do, you know, commission only on that side or explain it to them is uh, is always a challenge. Oh, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I have one quick follow up question. If nobody else has a question. Um, Okay, um, it looks like you guys are doing specifically targeting uh, kind of brick and mortar stores. Like I, we saw a lot of restaurants in that short clip. Um, I imagine it lends well to dry cleaners, veterinarian services, things like that. But does it lend itself to small business services where like in COVID time, so many of us are operating out of our homes um, and, and stuff like that. Me personally, I'm a professional organizer and I was trying to think how uh, your services would lend to my, or to my structure and um, I'm not seeing that. So I'm just curious if you're specifically targeting brick and mortar businesses. 100% every type of business, the, the guy who developed the app, you know, they, everyone always thinks restaurants first, but me is formerly having, you know, Outback, Fleming's, Carabas, and Bonefish's customers and Wi-Fi marketing. I know that industry works. Uh, so um, I definitely go after the, serv the service industry and any type of industry that anyone wants. You only have to have brick and mortar because when, when someone actually finding you, your location via the directory, is they're going to find it by the address. And then your, your creative can drive them directly to your website. And even if it's a restaurant or delivery, as long as you have delivery service, our app integrates with every delivery service. So they can go directly to your delivery platform. The person looking at you can have, set up a delivery and order directly from the app, completely contactless. So um, it's, it, it's, it really is everything is already uh, taken care of. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, your neighbor in Northern Peoria, we should talk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, hopefully we'll get your contact information here. Sure, sure. I'll put it in here.
Thanks. So Walter, I know we've spoken with you in the past. Um, have you reached out to Chambers of Converse and talked to them about this and what has been your feedback, if so? Glendale said, I want this, I want this right now. I don't want any other chamber to have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good. And, uh, finalizing with those guys tomorrow, I said, you know, it's, of course they can't be exclusive because they would have to pay a bunch of money for that. But I told them I've only been talking to Glendale and, you know, and Scott over at Peoria and Scott's doing a bunch of different things. His social media person said, I love this. I don't understand why we ha won't have it yet. And, um, and then there's some some other chambers that I've spoken to, and um, and in Tennessee actually Knox, Knoxville Chamber of Commerce, and uh, they're going to adapt it. But uh, it just makes total sense because you can add the cost of it into a membership or whatever you want to do if you want to carry it yourself. But Peoria is waiting on funding. It's coming from a grant they're trying to get to pay for marketing. Is the last I've heard. Yeah, it makes a lot of. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, sorry. I've got a question about your geofencing technology. Yes. Um, so the way I understand it is currently when someone is in the area of the business, they, their promotional uh, notification or whatever will be sent out to that customer. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, those geofencing is broken into four parts. We're the only one in the world that I say, okay, Eric, you go to Fry's. Uh, Saturday at 10 o'clock. So Thursday at 9 p.m., I'll send you a promotion to say add this to your to your grocery list. And then when you know when you're on the way to fries, we'll give you another promotion to say go down aisle seven and pick up a case of Heineken. So we can hit you on the way while you're at home, while you're at a competitive location, and it's be a push note or an app, and we can do that. But we also have 100 million plus historical devices that can actually contact person without geofencing at all. And that's why it's number one. Yeah, and that, and that uh, I was interested in the creative potential of the geofencing, how you could set it up, like you had mentioned just now, like if you go to a customer or a, a competitor's location, you'll get a notification. Yeah. And I was uh, thought that was really interesting because a city could say, hey, you know, if you're visiting, you know, our sports stadium complex, you would get a notification of businesses around it or um, yeah. if you knew that there was a certain, uh, I don't know, gathering point that made people want to purchase XYZ, you could set it to do that. So I think that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I told Tim over at City of Peoria, say you, you waste some money on your spring training thing. I can tell you people that are in San Diego and Seattle that actually like baseball. They, they watch baseball on TV They've been to Peoria, they have enough money to go hiking, et cetera. So I can grab those people, bring them to Peoria, and then drive them to Cheesecake Factory or other places around the country or in the city. And we can do that because we know the people's habits and their household income, ethnic group, whatever you want to say, and, and all of that type of stuff. So a whole nother level is, is what we do. So just don't even think about what you've heard from years ago. And so my, my last question, anybody else have last question? All right, then I'll throw it out there, which is Walter, like your system is, it, which I love, is so large and incorporates everything into it. To a certain degree, it's a little intimidating, right? Like, where do I even start? Like, do, do I have to get a whole community? I think, you know, chambers sort of can wrap their head around that. But do you have any options for like, if it was just the geofencing that they're interested in, breaking that into? And what, what does that kind of look like? Okay, so yeah, for a business for close by, it literally takes... I don't know, maybe 15 seconds to sign up. You just go to the site and say, my business is XXX and I'm at 345 Broadway. It'll come up and say, is this your business? You say, yes, you click it. And so you sign up. That's how long it takes. And then we'll get with you to actually set up your profile. So that on that part. For geofencing, you just simply just send me an email. And at that point, it's where is your customer? Who is your customer? And what does your customer do? If you know those, then we can actually go into the system and bring it all up for you and tell you, like, you forgot about this. And then we set it up in 21 different types of creatives that we can actually do. And you can actually start a campaign literally 
four days after uh, you're done. I just did a huge one for Avanti, and they're excited about that at the corporate office about that. Really easy. Very cool. All right. So just a reminder, Walter is looking for this community for connections with economic development or chamber organizations that might be interested in his advanced marketing technology. I summarize that good right there, Walter? Absolutely perfect. All right. Big round of applause for Walter. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you, guys. All right. And so now on to our second presenter for today. Go ahead, Jen. Kristen, um, hey, Walter, please make sure you give you put your contact information so I'm that we right can find you. Okay. Thank you. There you go. All right, Nargish, uh, we have Allison on the line, so I think we are good to go. She's listening in. Nargish, we're super excited to hear about what you are working on. So you've got six minutes. You want to pull up your presentation and share your screen. As you get set up there. There you go. Yeah. You good to go? Perfect. Uh, is this on... We can see your screen. You have six minutes. I'll give you a uh, visual signal when you're getting close to six minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Take it away, Nargish. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today to present. My name is Nargish. I am, I just started grad school <laughs> at ASU this semester and today I'll be presenting Dashing Devils. So Dashing Devils, is a clothing closet resource for ASU students to uh, consume fashion um, sustainably and ethically. And so you may be wondering, well, why do we need that, right? Well, in 2013, uh, there was around 15 million tons of clothing waste produced according to the EPA. That's a lot. I can't even com comprehend 1 million ton, right? So what does this do? This creates environmental damage to our planet. And some of the big violators of that damage are from fast fashion brands like Zara and H&M. And Zara and H&M as well have been questioned time and time again of how ethical their clothing is produced. But we need to understand why are these fast fashion brands so popular, right? Well, I say they have the fast fashion trifecta. They're trendy. They always produce really uh, trendy clothes. Uh, they're very accessible right? Um, there's always a Zara or an H&M in a mall nearby you. And they're very inexpensive, which makes them all the more attractive for consumers to buy. What Dashing Devils is here to do is to combat environmental harm created by uh, fast fashion brands um, and also to provide students with clothing that can be used from a range of daily use to keep themselves warm for the day to even professional use uh, to help them advance in their career development, which is very important, especially for college students because creating that first impression at a job interview is everything. And so when they have something accessible uh, and, they, and uh, free, they don't have to worry about um, the cost and uh, the accessibility of said uh, professional clothing. So, I have nothing to wear, right? That's something that we say some, when we go to our closets and we look at this, like, ah, I have nothing to wear. Uh, and we're all guilty of doing that, right? So to really combat, um, uh, to really promote sustainable behavior and acts um, at ASU or in the, in the student population, we have to uh, think about how we're going to design um, the Dashing Devil clothing closet, right? So first clothes will be free and we will be doing donation drives in order to obtain clothes and any other items that we may need. Uh, a physical space is also needed uh, where the clothing will be uh, organized and stored so that way students can come in and do quote unquote shopping. Uh, and then we will also be having, our plan is to have a pop-up events every once a month to uh, kind of get, uh, get the presence at ASU going uh, so people will know that we're here. Um, and then also collaborative and educational events, right? So for us to truly be sustainable, um, we need to educate uh, the student population about the harms of fashion, uh, fast fashion or uh, how we can really be more sustainable in our consumption of fashion. And, and other collaborative events like fashion shows would be pretty nice uh, as well. Now, I'm a true believer uh, that collaboration is key 
Uh, and I've been in uh, plenty of organizations where collaboration really helps achieve goals. And I find Dashing Devils to be no different. Uh, so luckily, we have ha we do have a lot of uh, support at ASU West in particular um, with the administration and the Office of Student Engagement um, and the Pitchfork Pantry as well, which is actually university wide. And we are hoping to work in tandem with uh, all of these uh, uh, offices. And uh, of course, because we are a clothing closet, right, we would need to work with uh, external uh, external programs like Goodwill, Dillard, so on and so forth. Uh, so those are just kind of uh, some partners that we have in mind or have already gained support from. Now, in the there have been two barriers that we've identified in this venture. The first barrier would be stigma. Uh, unfortunately, when somebody asks for help, uh, they feel very ashamed of doing so. There is a lot of stigma in asking for help, especially when it comes to basic needs. Uh, so we must first remind through our educational events uh, is that we are not a charity case for poor kids. We need to be very clear on how we present ourselves and that and we should not present ourselves that way. Instead, that this is a sustainable effort and this is just a sustainable method of for you to get clothing. Right. And again, uh, through education and collaborations, um, that can only be possible. The second barrier that we ha have identified is space. Uh, at ASU, especially at ASU West, <laughs> fighting for space, you fight tooth and nail for space. <laughs> um, and so we've come up with the idea that uh, why not bring a trailer at the West Campus? That could be really helpful in storing the clothes and students coming in and having some privacy too and getting what they need. And so we are working with uh, various faculty and staff members to find spaces on other campuses as well, because we don't just want to restrict ourselves to one campus at ASU. ASU is a very large school with multiple campuses. Now, sustainability. Now, I talk about sustainability, environmental health, blah, 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 right? But there's more than one ways to be sustainable, right? What about sustainability within the people who are involved in, um, in Dashing Devils? So we are planning to have a leadership team. Uh, we are currently in the process of trying to get more student leaders on the team. Uh, volunteers, so who's gonna be manning uh, the Dashing Devils, right? Volunteers, and we'll be working with the volunteer schedules of like two hours a day that we're open. Funding, um, luckily I was able to get a grant from Changemaker, but additionally uh, we, have the re we have resources like USG GPSA, um, other internal external grants that are available. And we have also recently set up an ASU foundation page. Plan it. So again, uh, just the way we can educate our students, we can educate our students on how to be more sustainable uh, through collaborations. And we also fit some ASU sustain sustainability goals. And to measure the impacts, uh, we'll be doing surveys pre and post uh, coming into the uh, clothing closet. So that is it. That is my presentation. And I am open for questions. Big round of applause for Nargish. Well done, lady. So many questions to ask, but we'll start with the first one, which is what can the One Million Cups community do for you? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, we have two barriers, right? And the really main big barrier is space. Um, ASU is very bureaucratic when it comes to space. <laughs> so uh, I would like to ask the One Million Cups community um, that we are looking for someone, uh, we are looking to connect with someone who can provide a trailer to house all the clothing in. That's my first ask. Um, my second ask is uh, connecting us to people who, who can help facilitate partnerships for donations. And uh, so donations like any items to help store the clothing or the clothing itself, so on and so forth. There you go. All right. Questions for Nargish and Dashing Devils. Go ahead, Marcus. Hi, Nargish. Thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the things I'm curious about with this type of thing is just the quality of clothing. Is, is the aspect here to collect all types of clothing and evaluate it from there? Or um, is there particular levels of quality of clothing that you're able to collect? Uh, can you walk us through the process a little bit more with that? Great question. 
So uh, kind of what came up with the, when I first came up with this idea, I was really struggling to find clothing that fits me. <laughs> and so one, I really want the clothing that we get to be gender inclusive um, and uh, size inclusive. That's very important. Um, we don't all come in one size. And then in terms of quality of the clothing, like how clean or decent, we, we are asking for decent wearable clothing. Um, new clothing is too, but uh, anything that's not <laughs> like a rag. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. All right. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Two quick questions, uh, if yeah. I'm allowed to do that. Number one, is there a fashion merchandising program uh, at ASU that you could potentially partner with that could really stage that space? Uh, so that is very attractive for users and they're not feeling like um, they're a charity case by using it and then also allowing those students to get that, that critical experience and perhaps and even soliciting partnerships with, with uh, retailers? Um, there is a fashion department at ASU. I'm actually part of this uh, humanities lab course, Sustainable Fashion. And one of the faculty members is um, a, from the fashion department. And I was hoping that uh, I would contact her actually this week since classes have just started to kind of see um, if they can maybe lend us space and ha help us um, uh, with a collaborative partnership there. Excellent. And second quick question. What was your second question? Best case scenario, um, you get wonderful donations from Dillard's and Macy's and you have this wonderful treasure trove of items. How would you prevent abuse from perhaps students who would take those items and resell them on Poshmark or, or another uh, platform like that? Oh, I have never actually thought of that. Um, so how I was kind of of envisioning it in high school we were all on the honor system um, is you take what clothes you need no questions asked um, and nobody and and there was no malicious intent in getting said clothes um, I am hoping I, I was gonna just do the honor system here as well but uh, that's something I we do need to think about and thank you for bringing that up I, I actually don't know how to answer that question because I have never thought of that being uh, as a problem. Uh, so I have a question and a comment. Uh, so uh, a comment to follow up um, is, since you are in an academic environment, it seems like it'd be very easy to levy a penalty on someone if they happen to steal from the closet. Um, and then uh, my question was, would stocking luxury brands things like Gucci or whatever, help draw student interest um, and shake off the charity case image um, versus stocking only affordable brands. Eric, do you have a hookup? Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, I wish. That was, that was such a specific brand name. It was like, you know, Gucci or whatever. Gucci. All the girls are like, hey, <laughs> you have a Gucci hookup, Eric. Like, yeah. Eric, are you just like hoarding Gucci somewhere? Well, I'm thinking you're a secondhand Neverfull. So but I also know that a lot of luxury brands, things that they can't sell, they choose to destroy. Um, so that it might be an avenue to pursue with, you know, collaboration and whatnot. There you go. Um, distracted by if you had it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think Eric's question uh, real quick was, will your focus, and I, and I agree because I was, your presentation talked about H&M, like, and some of the cheaper brands being like the biggest culprits of sustainability challenges and mm -hmm. Eric's question, but then you talked about students wanting something different. So I think the general question is like, kind of what is your target in terms of what type of clothes you would like to go out there with? Uh, and his question was around luxury brands. Does that make sense as a target? Because students might be more interested in that and it would overcome your stigma. Mm. 
Yeah, so I mean, when people donate, we're not asking, can you give us Gucci only? Can you give us Zara H&M only? I think whatever clothes we get, we'd be really grateful for. Um, I do, I, it would it would actually accept students though, who did have um, kind of those luxury brands, right? Um, first, and then we can go on from there. Go ahead, Jen. Um, I would recommend if you are, if luxury items are donated, that could be something where you would want to maybe hold a raffle or um, something like that to help raise money for the closet to pay for the space or the trailer or whatever. And then that particular item could be the incentive for people to make donations. You know, you donate 10 pairs of jeans and you are entered to win this amazing Gucci purse, you know, that kind of thing. I think that could, <laughs> I would mm -hmm. definitely not give away luxury items for All Gucci stuff that Eric's hoarding yeah. that he's going to donate. Yeah, exactly. Don't give that away. <laughs> that will encourage people to put, turn around and put that stuff on Poshmark. So at least you're not giving it away for free. You are getting something back. Um, my, my question is, have you been in contact with the people over at Fabric? The Fashion and Business Resource I have not. Incubators. Okay. Um, they have, um, their entire goal is to be eco-conscious and um, green. So you may, um, if you put your information in the chat, I will do an email and introduce you to those ladies. Are you trying to connect with Amelia Walsh? Or Angela Johnson or anyone? Familiar with her. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will send you the, um, I will do an introduction email for you. And then you can go over and talk to them about what you're doing and take a tour of the facility. Because I think they are going to be right up your alley. Um, the other okay. thing that I do is I have a, my own fashion brand. And I know that there are a lot of designers and we have samples and we have all of these things that we can't really can't sell, but we can definitely donate and give to you. So that way you can put those in the closet. Um, so yeah, I think fabric might be the perfect place for you to um, find some of your community. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think Fabric will be a great resource. And I know this is going to come to no surprise to people on the call. I got about a thousand questions in which to go with. But uh, the one that I'll start with is why space? So if space is one of your biggest barriers, knowing that like any college, it's going to be that way. And especially knowing in COVID times, it's only going to get worse and it opens you up to more risk why have a physical mm -hmm. space? And have you explored any uh, options around not having a physical space or what that might even look like? Yeah, so space, um, first in terms of just storing the clothing. I feel like, especially now with the pandemic, if I have, say, I, say you donate clothes to me, right? I don't mm -hmm. have space. So I'm like, okay, I'll just keep it in my house or Allison will keep it at her house. I, people would probably freak out like, well, we don't know what's going on in their house. What kind of germs do they have, right? So having that separate location where nobody's touching anything and only one or two people have access to it would be, um, would be an ease for people's minds, especially in the pandemic. So that's one. But two, as I mentioned before, uh, kind of, we were also planning to have pop-up events um, not just to build our presence, but um, maybe students can see like what kind of clothes we have maybe and to do like a clothing exchange. Because um, again, we don't want to do the whole charity case for poor kids, right? So that that's my space. And to and for the student to also have a shopping experience. Yeah, okay. And so I, I like I said, I have a bunch of ideas on it. In general, like what my gut is. Uh, and I know you've been working with Allison, so I'm sure she's mentioned like Venture Devils and the programs that we have throughout that. Cause I do, I think you've got a great idea. I think that there's a lot of, I'll encourage you to continue to refine it. Like what is the exact problem that you're solving? Is it sustainability or is it students needing clothes? 
right? And even within sustainability, like you had a couple of like, well, students like H&M and because, and so we're going to replace it. So you had a, just a couple of points that I think the more that you refine it and even get it down to like a really narrow, what is it that students could use? Because if it's just sustainability, you don't want students to go out and buy new clothes. That could be a really interesting, uh, you, that could shift your entire approach. And I understand what you're saying about space. And what I heard there is we need storage space, which is much different than storefront space. And so even being specific on that, like we can find you a, a secure storage space, but storefront space is very different. And so in general, I think that that's just like one example of, I think the continue on it, you're on a great path. And I think there's some really clever things that you have going in there, continue to refine. What is the problem? Who is the target? What are you gonna carry? And what is the best way to execute it? Because I think that there's gonna be a lots of innovation in the way that you continue to refine that. Uh, so we'll follow up, but those are that's kind of just some of my general thoughts to start with. And I would really think, I agree, so the space question is like a million dollar question to me if that's the biggest issue. Like what does a pop-up event look like and how do you even just do it online where it's like, no, you just need a black suit. And I think the more that you refine it, it's going to make it easier for you versus asking everybody for everything. It's like, I just need capsule collection white t-shirts because that's what people are buying at H&M. And I'm going to make that sustainable. Like you could literally make it like that narrow. And I think it would help people narrow, like figure out how to support you easier and get traction earlier. All right, Kristen's little rant there. Yes, uh, that brings us right up until 10 o'clock. So any other questions for Nargish before we leave? I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, and I may, have, I may have missed it and my geo mine is on now. So is your customer, in case I missed it, people that go to H&M, but also go to Buffalo Exchange as an example? Uh, my customer? So my customer would be like the ASU student. Um, I, I don't think I understand the question. <laughs> but Because I know I've, I drove past U of A once and I know they have a Buffalo Exchange right next to the campus. And Buffalo Exchange is a kind of like my sister's closet, whatever. They actually have high-end clothes that people actually go buy. So it's, is that what you're basically mm -hmm. doing where it's not one particular brand, but it's good clothing for the students? Oh, so we haven't thought about just sticking to one particular brand, just having clothes for students to wear daily and professionally. I, I do know, I, I didn't have the conversation, but Allison did have a conversation in the past with Buffalo Exchange to possibly get some donations from there. Yeah, Buffalo Exchange mm -hmm. um, picks a nonprofit um, each day for the clothes that are not bought by them but the mm -hmm. purse, the seller doesn't want to take them either, so they donate them. Right. So Buffalo Exchange has a nonprofit that they donate those clothes to, and they're very open to having us be a partner for that. Right, but you have the same customer, obviously. Got you. All right. And so what, what I'll kind of dovetail and wrap up Walter's comment there, which is, again, kind of gets back to that refinement, right? ASU has 100,000 students on campus. Mm -hmm who are those students that you want to target? Uh, why wouldn't you want them to go to Buffalo Exchange? Why wouldn't we just do a marketing campaign to push them to Buffalo Exchange? How are you going to be different than, than some of those resources? So I think that that just kind of gets to, because what he's talking about there is that allows you to start marketing. If you can say, yep, it's students that go to Buffalo Exchange mm -hmm. and ASU students. Now, like Walter and other platforms exist out mm -hmm. there. That's like, you can really narrow in on who that person is and be able to market to them. So I think it's just kind of continued back on who is that exact person and what are you trying to do for them? All right. Big one more round of applause. One million cups welcome for Nargish. Mm -hmm. For sure. Make sure. Brilliant idea. We're so excited. Thank you so much, Nargish. Thank you, Allison, for bringing Nargish to us. Uh, make sure you put your contact information. Jenny is frantically worried that she, you are about to jump off the line and she will not get your contact information. So uh, we will not shut down the room until Nargish gets her contact information in the chat. Uh, so a couple of things in the chat. Make sure you type it in there. We've got Nargish's contact so that she is uh, looking for 
for help with space, looking for help with uh, some partners. Walter is looking for contacts out in the economic development world for his marketing platform, as well as Chamber of Commerce. And of course, my favorite presentation, no offense, Snargish and Walter, Kensington Slice, our amazing young entrepreneur, has her digital cookie link in the chat. I will put that in there as well, since I know we had a couple of people join late. Believe me, guys, feel free to share. It was the best pitch you've ever seen. Am I right? It was, it was a knockout. So uh, make sure that you support her in her cookie fest uh, for this year. So thank you, everybody. I always love this. It's so wonderful to start off uh, a year with One Million Cups. And I'm so excited to see our East Valley representation, as well as to see such amazing, shiny entrepreneurs coming together, no matter what, to share ideas and move things forward. So thank you so much for joining us. We will be meeting the fourth Wednesday. So we got a couple of people in the pipeline, but make sure if you have anybody who's interested and speaking that was the next time we'll join is january 27th we hope to see you all there thank you very much everyone be well and be safe did we get argus's co contact in the chat are we good yes. all right thank you thank you Bye. thank you guys